Good morning, everybody. Hi, I hope you're all enjoying lunch. Um, we're gonna start the talk pretty soon. My name is Jenna Perlman, and I am one of the student managers at the Roberts Environmental Center, um, which is co-hosting the Green Careers Conference with lovely um, student impact. Um, and I'm currently a senior at Scripps. I'm studying environmental analysis, and I'm here to introduce Michael Graper, our esteemed speaker for today. So. He's an eight-time Emmy recipient. He's a CMC class of 74, and he became a cinematographer by pursuing his passion for mountain climbing. After graduating from Claremont McKenna College with a degree in philosophy, he moved to the Eastern Sierra Nevadas to join the ranks of climbing and skiing adventurers who made their living in the mountains. Winters were spent teaching skiing at Mammoth Mountain and summers guiding for the Palisades School of Mountaineering, which operated out of Big Pine, California. His illustrious climbing career has encompassed expeditions to remote mountain ranges around the world, including the Alaskan Range, the Andes, the Himalayas, Greenland, the jungles of the Amazon, and the Antarctic Peninsula. Graber has worked on a number of award-winning television documentaries, netting eight national Emmys along the way. Graber's credits also include feature films such as Dust to Glory, 007 Die Another Day, Endless Summer 2, Crimson Tide, Twister, Almost Heroes, and 70 millimeter IMAX films such as Storm Chasers, Amazon, Wild California, and Shackleton. He currently splits his time between Capistrano Beach and Bishop, California. He also sits on the board of the Roberts Environmental Center. Today he will talk to us about the various, sometimes unexpected events that led to his current career. Please welcome Michael Graber. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to see uh, friends from back when I was here and see President Stark and Jill. It's really a wonderful opportunity for me. Um, I was just thinking uh, in the symposium I was in just prior to lunch that uh, terms like carbon footprint and sustainability um, and global climate change didn't even exist when I was leaving Claremont, I mean, we were very acutely aware of the, the smog situation in the Pomona Valley, but all these other um, things, we had no way of knowing at that time that they would have such a profound effect on the planet. So um, so I'm, I'm not able to, to tell you what careers you're gonna uh, be working in once you leave CMC because they probably don't have a name yet, but I can tell you kind of how I navigated through life and um, and some of the lessons that I learned, and I and I think they'll apply to um, those of you who are leaving Claremont and experiencing the same existential dread that I did when I, when I was a senior. I thought I I would start off by just saying, well, I'm basically known as an adventure um, cameraman or adventure cinematographer, and I would tell you what that means, and it means basically that you you have some pre-existing passion or some pre-existing skill that. Um, makes you uniquely suited for working in a certain environment. For me, it was climbing. But it also means that you move big mountains of luggage uh, across airports all over the world. Because in addition to equipment that you might need to, uh, for climbing or for skiing or for whatever it is that you do, you also have to have all this um, camera equipment as well. Um, it means that the producers save money because they don't have to put you in expensive hotels. <laughs> and you're sort of expected that you can, they can dump you off uh, on a glacier somewhere and come back a month later and that you would have the ability to somehow survive, thrive, and um, have a film to, to hand off. It also means that your diet... Um, depends a lot on what you can locally source. In this case, in South America, it's uh, Quaker Oats and Mountain House freeze-dried dinners. I don't recommend this diet, but it's often necessary. And there's a certain amount of ingenuity that you need. Uh, for instance, if you have a frozen can of tuna and no fork or spoon, uh, knowing that you can always use an ice hammer to eat the tuna. Um, of course, it always means that uh, some of the, the best opportunities for filming are the least nice to leave the tent. So you always are looking for those times when you absolutely don't want to get out of the tent and know that it's, there's always an opportunity to film. 
oddly, um, because a lot of adventure is, is dependent on automobiles, there's a lot of uh, sort of automobile uh, savvy that comes in helpful, um, in this case, driving to Pat through Patagonia, knowing how to get out of a, uh, stuck in a car, or um, there's sometimes that, sometimes it's more difficult to extract yourself from um, a misadventure than uh, others. And, and I always imagine uh, the conversation in this Toyota 4Runner that stalled out in the middle of Steel Creek, Alaska, that, that was probably went like something like this. Well, shall we go for it? Yeah, what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> um, and welding is not a bad thing to know if you're going to be um, if you're going to be traveling really rough roads for uh, weeks at a time because the suspension on these vehicles takes a beating. So um, it's also a, a good skill to have. And sometimes there are calamities that. Um, you just put your hands in your pocket and you try to figure out, or you say to yourself, what am I going to do now? And you, and you have to remember that adventure begins when something goes wrong. And the other thing is never lose, lose sight of, your, of a sense of humor. Um, and, I, and I have a lot of people um, say, gee, that job sounds so neat. They haven't seen this part of the slideshow. But um, you know, I would love to help you out on, um, on a job. And so. My daughter, uh, Elizabeth, who's a junior at UC Santa Cruz, I took her on a job. I don't often work on sound stages, but um, I had a job working with uh, Amy Poehler, an incredibly bright, uh, really wonderful person. I said, Lizzie, uh, come work with us. And so she came on this job, and it was pretty cool because you know there's uh, you know catered deli sandwiches and stuff like that in the lunch break. Um, and then the next job I worked with Lizzie was in Yosemite. Uh, not far from the Burger Reserve, and um, she found out that um, when you work a backcountry job, you're not only you not only have a backpack with your tent and your stove and your food, and your sleeping bag and your pad uh, and clothing, but you also have all this camera equipment. And no one makes a back a backpack that'll fit all the camera equipment: lenses, the tripod, the camera, extra batteries, map boxes, blah da 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 da. So um, I took her on this job, and uh, this was the last time she ever wanted to um, <laughs> go with me. Um, I learned to climb when I was 17, and this is um, me right there. You can see how nervous I am by how the red dot um, oscillates. But um, at 17, and, I, and it's, it was an age where I think a lot of 17-year-old uh, boys and girls, you're looking for something to, to lock in on. You, you're looking for something more in life. And that uh, was it for me. And I came to Claremont, and um, I played football in high school. And I came to Claremont uh, in part because it offered an opportunity to play football here as well. And while I was... Um, here. So football season was always like you really have no time other than to study and to practice and to play. Um, but after the season, there was times uh, to go off and, and adventure. And, and Pomo at Pomona College at this time was Andy Embick, who was a Rhodes Scholar um, and a gifted climber. He was older than I was, uh, and he um, also a more experienced climber. So I kind of gravitated um, towards Andy. And in the, for winter break in 1972, we had planned uh, a trip to the Palisade Glacier, a winter climbing trip, with th uh, two other Pomona students and myself. And um, this is Andy warming his toes, because it was, um, you know, the, although the Sierra Nevada can be very warm and pleasant, and it can also be kind of brutal. And we climbed a peak, and on the way uh, down from this peak, uh, Dan Hines, a Pomona student, who was right behind me, slipped and fell to his death. And uh, of course, it was a shock, right? And I came, um, I came home. Uh, my mom had me go to his parents' house. They had knew of their son's death to, to talk to his family, to try to explain what happened. And I came back to uh, Claremont uh, for second semester, very unhinged, and um, and I found like I, there was a lot of soul searching because when something happens, when someone 
who is right behind you suddenly disappears and is gone forever, you're faced with your own mortality. I, I sense that I was faced with my own, own mental mortality. And there was a lot that I had to reconcile. And so but, uh, between classes, I would go up to the top of Mount Baldy. Here, here's Mount Baldy on a particularly beautiful uh, February day. Um, and did a lot of, a lot of soul searching. And, and what I came up with is, is I had seen firsthand the amount of pain that this sport I was so passionate about could inflict on the people that, that loved you. And I realized that if I was going to continue down this, this path, I had to be absolutely 100% focused and committed to it. I had to, you know, eat, eat breathe, and sleep mountain climbing and never lose sight of the fact that Dan f fell to his death on the way down from the summit so that in life when you reach the summit you're only halfway so you still have to get home so I'm, I'm, I reconciled that and someone told me you know with situations with a death like that sooner or later you have to let go of the death you have to, of the dead and you have to keep pushing forward and so every um, you know summer break or spring break at any time I would go on up to Yosemite and we were climbing these uh, walls in Yosemite on uh, El Capitan and um, there, it's sort of a um, type of a climbing it's it's like you're putting in pieces of you're putting in anchors and you're standing on them and you're slowly working your way up which is sort of an old-school uh, climbing technique now but um, that's kind of what I was into at that time where these was wall climbing is what it was called and it meant that um, there were always multi-day climbs maybe they would take five or six days to slowly get up 3,000 vertical feet 3,200 vertical feet so you were either sleeping on ledges like uh, on the northwest northwest face of half dome right here or maybe if there was no ledge then you'd string a hammock um, and sleep in that which I had practiced outside of Boswell because, because they, there was a beautiful oak tree there, and I, um, and I had strung a hammock, and Dave Hatton, the RA at, uh, at Boswell at that time, might remember, and I spent the night sleeping there. So it was like people, you know, Friday night, people coming back from parties, and it's like, whoa, you know, he's in the tree sleeping. So, um, and this is uh, also at Claremont, I met Jim Lucky, who was a young math, math professor, also uh, very passionate about climbing, and it was, and that was really a huge advantage of being at Claremont, is because it was a small community. You knew all these people. Jim knew that I was in in the climbing. I found out that he loved backcountry skiing and, and easy climbing, and you could have a relationship with your your professors outside of the classroom, which which I always thought was incredible, incredibly uh, meaningful. So I graduate from Claremont, and believe it or not, I mean it's just, it's it's a pretty much a crushing uh, debt when you leave here. You know, four years at Claremont cost you know my family sixteen thousand dollars, and um, yeah, right. It's that's a lot of money, right? So, and it's hard for your parents when their friends are saying, "Well, now that that Michael graduated, what's he doing?" And and it's hard for them to say, "Well, he's living out of the back of his pickup truck, and he's and he's climbing, he's traveling around to rock climbing areas, and he's climbing." But I actually had a, a bigger plan. And before Google Earth, which is such an amazing, uh, for me, such an amazing program, if you wanted to um, like explore an area that they didn't really have a lot of, you know, no one had really been into or climbed in it, you needed to um, research topographical maps and stereoscopic photographs. And these, so you put two photographs together, and if you look, there's like um, this little part of the glacier there matches this little part of the glacier there. These two brown spots match these two brown spots. So you kind of assemble these pictures together and you, you cross your eyes and you stare at it a while and, then, and after a while you sort of get a three-dimensional uh, impression of what the topography would be in this area. And this happens to be an area uh, called the Kachatna Spires in, in Alaska. And it had been climbed, a few people had climbed in there, but not really um, anybody. So I, and this is what you find in this uh, tight uh, web, this tight maze 
of glaciated peaks. And you could, you know, that's 3,300 feet, which is like an El Capitan in Yosemite Valley, right there, coming right up out of a glacier. And I was uh, felt kind of uh, suited to this type of climbing because I, you know, I'd done some winter climbing and some ice climbing in the Sierra Nevada, also the big wall climbing in um, Yosemite. And these were really basically a big walls in a remote area. All, all of these, like most of these unclimbed, and a few of these had been named, but by gold miners that were working the uh, gold claims to the east of this area. So uh, I went with a friend from UC Santa Barbara, um, a high school friend from Santa Monica High School, David Black, and uh, Human Apron. Now Human was, um, back when the Shah was in charge of Iran, he had a program where the the best and the brightest Iranian students uh, could get Iranian scholarships to go to U.S. universities. And he was the Shaw Scholar, and he came to UCLA, and then married um, an American uh, girl, and then became an American citizen. But incredibly strong. And uh, so we drove up the Alaskan Highway, which then was a thousand miles of dirt, to get to a little town that's about uh, an hour and a half north of Anchorage called Talkeetna. In Talkeetna, there were bush pilots that could fly you. When the weather was good, they could fly you in the, into the Alaska range, land on uh, ski-equipped uh, Cessna 185s. You'd offload all your equipment, and the pilot would say, OK, when do you want me back? And you'd say, OK, we want to see you in a month. And you'd go, OK, we'll see you. On some mountains, like Denali, where there's a lot of air, air traffic, where they're flying in, it's not such a big problem. But the Kachatna Spires are way to one side, so it was, you were very much on your own. So while we waited for the um, weather to clear, we slept in a leaky um, hangar. Um, and then once the weather cleared, here's an airplane that, would, that dropped us off on this glacier that I had figured out from looking at those aerial photographs that even late in the year, there would be enough snow up high on the glacier where the pilot could land. And um, so we spent uh, a month in there climbing um, these various, various peaks. Now, here's the deal with the Kachatna Spires. They're not really high. The highest peak in there is under 10,000 feet. And this is Alaska in the summertime. So that means if precipitation is going to fall, it's going to be wet. Uh, before you know, before the early 1970s, the down was the only clothe, clothing that was considered useful in, for climbing situations. But down in a wet environment gets soaked and, there, and it loses all of its insulating ability. So a technology actually had come up with these poly or these um, polyester fiber filled uh, jackets that uh, that we believed would keep you. Uh, warm when you were wet because it would maintain the loft. So in a weird way, this t uh, uh, an advancement in technology gave us the confidence to go attempt some of these um, sheer walls. But eventually, in this area, because it's very well known for bad weather, um, a storm would come in and you'd be stuck on a ledge uh, or, or hanging um, until it cleared. And here are these, these jackets that that we um, had. They were made by a company called Snow Lion that's long uh, gone out of business. Um, but, but you know what? I mean, all these uh, technology is great, and it certainly kept us warm, but it's still a bit of a, um, bit of a, supper, a suffer fest climbing on these peaks. But when you're young uh, and tough and, you've, and you're motivated, um, you could, we could get up these things. And so some of these climbs, reached certain notoriety in the climbing world. Um, and this was a cover of Climbing Magazine on one of the climbs we did. And, but sort of our crowning glory was this peak here. And it was a route that um, went up this face, along this ridge, and up this face to the top of that peak there. It's called Middle Triple Peak. And that was on the summit of Middle Triple Peak. How do you know it's the summit? Well, there's nothing higher, right? Uh, and that, that became a chapter in the book, uh, 50 Classic Climbs in North America. Uh, and it went uh, over a dozen years before it got a second ascent by a, another friend of mine, uh, Conrad Anker uh, and his partner. So through this climbing, I met a filmmaker, Mike Hoover. And, 
And he, Mike Hoover would be one of the most instrumental uh, figures in my life because he basically mentored me, and that's so important in no matter what occupation you you go into, wherever you know your career takes you, a mentor can make all the difference. And he was doing a lot of films for ABC Sports, and so the first time I went with him was off to the Amazon jungle. This is in the Orinoco region of the Amazon jungle to climb that peak in the cloud. It's a, a geologic tapui. And this was sort of, you know, it was sort of stealth environmentalism because you, you had, a, you had an, an adventure film that in theory kept the tel television audience um, watching it, but then you would try to weave in little environmental messages throughout the film um, so that you weren't beating uh, this message you know, into an audience that really thought they were watching an adventure, an adventure film. Um, but this is where I learned about triple canopy jungle, which is um, triple canopy, the rain, you hear it raining on the top canopy, and about 30 seconds later you, hit it, you hear it hitting the second canopy, and then about 15 seconds, you know, so about a minute after you hear this tremendous rainstorm, it's raining on you uh, underneath. So it's really thick and it's miserable, it's full of bugs. Um, this gentleman, whoops, um, uh, this gentleman uh, be went on to become one of the most successful uh, DPs or director of photographies in Hollywood. He filmed um, Forrest Gump and another other, uh, number of other movies, Don Burgess. And uh, this Peter Palafian did a documentary uh, called Z Town and uh, uh, Z, uh, Dog Town and Z Boys uh, about skateboarding. But the Amazon, it's, it's, it's hard to fathom how big of a chunk of real estate the Amazon is until it was put in perspective uh, by someone who said, okay, that's, the Amazon River is the biggest river in, in the world, right? Uh, everyone knows that. Well, the second biggest river in the world would be the, be the Rio Negro were it not for the fact that it's just a tributary to the Amazon. So you could take, uh, you could take the, uh, the second largest river, the third, fourth, and fifth largest river during their flood stages add them all together and it still wouldn't exceed the amount of flow out of the Amazon. Years later, um, we went and with an IMAX film in the Amazon and this was a group of um, natives that had recently been contacted, you know, like you'd, you'd say discovered, but I mean, really, we didn't discover them, but um, some Brazilian scientists had made contact with this tribe and we were able to come in and film them for the IMAX film, the tribe swore that they had seen evidence of another tribe that they had never seen before. So uh, it kind of rocked home the fact that, and how refreshing really, that in the Amazon there could be people that, had never, that have never really been contacted by what we think of as the modern world. This was a photograph I got which to me kind of um, was a metaphor for life because it, here you have this small baby representing you know all life above water resting on a plant being supported by a plant resting on water and that to me sort of explained how life is able to exist on planet earth. Um, so we also went to Antarctica and I want to say that that there were a number of women uh, that would go on these trips Every one of them was so incredible, and, and, and they would be to the point where you'd say, oh, really strong female climber, but it was really just a plain, flat-out strong climber. And this uh, person right there, Beverly Johnson, and she was, she was one of them. So it's uh, me, Mike Hoover. Uh, this is Rick Ridgway, who's currently the CEO of Patagonia. And um, a, uh, this was a friend, an air, airline pilot, who'd just gone part of the way to Antarctica with us. Um, but I've actually been able to do um, a lot of trips in Antarctica. This one I, uh, I use to explain one of my favorite sayings, which is confidence is what you experience before you have all the facts. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and we did a lot of like sort of ex expeditions where we wanted to go from A to B from the coast to some uh, region inland. And it meant like uh, 
pulling sleds with all your equipment because these were these were unsupported trips. Now, um, in in your career, you're going to find that um, your your career often will take off, go off on on tangents, or or you're not quite sure if they're tangents at the time, but they'll go off in weird directions. And um, which mine did. And, and maybe it's, you know, you're like in the talk before lunch, someone was saying, yeah, I want, was gonna take the LSAT, but then I realized I didn't wanna do that, I wanted to do something else. Well, I ended up, uh, this is 1983, in a refugee camp at the, at the Pakistan-Afghanistan -Afgh border. And, um, just on the other side of the mountains is Afghanistan. This is just the southern part of the Tora Bora region, which was made famous by the hunt for uh, bin Laden. So um, when you think of, okay, climbers, they're, uh, you know, they're used to not taking baths. They eat cr you know, cruddy food. They can carry heavy backpacks and, and walk over uh, mountainous um, terrain uh, at night. Um, and um, and sleep in, in caves and in slot canyons and things like that. So um, I ended up on a film crew that was um, filming the war in Afghanistan in the 80s. So uh, in December 1979, um, Soviet Union uh, invaded Afghanistan after Afghanistan had a period of, of turmoil. Um, after uh, Ronald Reagan took office, um, he saw an opportunity to uh, get back at the Soviet Union for Vietnam by supplying arms to the Afghan Mujahideen. Um, the Afghan Mujahideen, however, um, oh, this is again Mike Hoover, uh, uh, my mentor. And this is, uh, whoops, um, the man on the left is Wahim Wardock, who 25 years later would become, become the Minister of Defense under the Karzai uh, government, but um, there were a lot of um, there were a lot of problems with uh, the Afghan war because um, in order to make it um, in order to make it popular with uh, with the public, you had to somehow get away from the fact that these guys look more like Charlie Manson. You you had to um, make them likable, and you had to make them. Um, I, I, you know, I don't want to say it, this was a marketing campaign, um, but um, in a sense it was. Um, but uh, we basically uh, we basically had a mission to um, present a war consistent with what Ronald Reagan was selling to the American people, and that was a very simplified David and Goliath story: the brave uh, Afghan mujahideen fighting the evil empire. Um, and, um, of course, the story is far more complicated than that because there were seven different uh, groups of Mujahideen. They all hated each other. Some were uh, fundamentalists, uh, Wahhabi fundamentalists like bin Laden was financing. Some were um, more moderate that we were traveling with. Um, so we spent uh, between 83 and 1988 a number of trips over there to, to basically bring home news footage. We were stringers, right? So in a war zone, networks aren't going to send staff people in the war zone where they might get injured or worse. So um, we were stringers, which meant that we were kind of these uh, gunslingers out um, in Pakistan where they could, um, we could go in and we could film various missions and get out, and then they would buy the footage from uh, Mike Hoover. Um, for the CBS Evening News. But, um, but part of the problem here um, were these flutter mines. Now these are, these are dropped out of helicopters by the tens of thousands, and they have like an aerodynamic quality to them, so they spin them as they fall, fall to earth. And um, I'm not a chemist, but somehow the centrifugal force of the spinning allows two chemicals to mix, and it sits um, on the ground and it becomes an explosive. And in war, um, you don't, the goal is not necessarily to kill people, it's to, it's to maim them. Because if you maim someone, and I don't know if you can see he's missing uh, large portions of both his hands, if you maim someone, it takes two or three people to get the guy out of the battlefield, and it takes first aid resources and medical resources to um, revive him. 
and um, you put a strain on resources uh, that way. Unfortunately, uh, children were the big, um, the unfortunate beneficiary of a lot of these mines because they didn't really understand what they were. And um, again, the mine was not designed to kill, but it was designed to maim. And um, but covering this part of the story was a big part of trying to trying to sanitize the Afghan, to distill it, to simplify it, and in certain some ways sanitize it so the American public would not approach it with the same way that they were approaching another covert war at the same time, which was the uh, supporting the Sandinistas in, in Central America, trying to overthrow the Nicaraguan government of Daniel Ortega. I told you this was going to be complicated. But um, eventually, uh, by the 19, uh, 1987, they because the Soviets controlled everything with the helicopters, the Afghans did not have any assets that could challenge helicopters until uh, the 1970s, and um, they, and lo and behold, uh, the Afghans had Stinger uh, surface-to-air missiles. So um, that was kind of a tangent uh, that my career took me off on. But in it, I met this, here's a woman, incredible woman. She's in an Islamic country. Um, but she was, a, she had graduated from Connecticut College. She had given, been given a State Department scholarship to study a strategic language, which was Urdu, in Pakistan. And Mike Hoover had met her, and she was uh, our sound person. But not a level playing field, right? A woman in an Islamic country with very conservative, hillbilly type people um, in a war zone. But uh, again, another example of, a, of someone just, you know, social con or uh, gender is a social construct, as my daughter's fond of saying. Um, so that was kind of, you know, I kind of was spun off on that realm. Now I'm back, Mount Everest, and I'm probably one of the few people that tried Mount Everest three times and never got to the summit. Uh, and when I'm receive uh, mild disdain for that, I say, I say, hey, look, I got all my fingers, I got all my toes. So, um, but this was, um, uh, I tried it once from uh, the West Ridge, which is this ridge from China, and got to up into here. And then uh, I tried it once with a National Geographic uh, team on the opposite side, the, the side that most people climb on. And then um, we tried uh, this route here in 1987. And that's where most of these um, photographs is, uh, okay, this is Wes and Millie Krause, and there's a CMC student with the same last name, because this is his mom and dad. Is he here? No? Oh, okay. Well, this is his, this is his mom and dad, so you can see uh, where the DNA uh, came from. Um, but they were on um, this Everest trip in 87. His dad actually... Um, organized, was one of the leaders of, his, of the trip. And I ended up climbing with a, um, a woman who was uh, going through medical school uh, at uh, U of, University of Washington, um, Mimi Stone. And, and uh, this, I like to say, is kind of a story of wind and snow. Because um, when you're, like here, the, there's the top of Everest, 29,000 feet, and we're down at like 19,000 feet or 20,000 feet. So there's this huge face there, and it could be uh, sunny and not snowing at all in your base camp, but yet the wind up high could be depositing huge amounts of snow up there that would then just come avalanching down. Uh, and so in 1987, this was one of my uh, close calls, is we were at the bottom down there when one of those things ripped off, broke off, and I swear I thought I was dead but um, I didn't. I woke up when I was alive. Um, but the, here's another thing about snow and wind is I think of it is snow and wind hates inequality. So if you put a footprint or if you cut a tent platform, uh, it, it hates that, that form of in, inequality and it's just going to bury it. And um, so once on the peak, we got buried, uh, our tent got buried. Um, and then this is up at tw about 25 and a half thousand feet 
uh, setting up a tent up ag against rocks on the, on the north face. And, and uh, this is the highest that I reached, which is about 28.2, 28.3. Um, and we're up in, in the yellow bands. And so we're up kind of up in here, sort of. And you go, oh, what's the big deal? You know, you're right there. And it was sort of like uh, we'd use oxygen to get to that point, and then we ran out of oxygen, and we dumped our bottles. But there's um, an effect where the, the oxygen's still cycling through your system, so you think you're, you're feeling pretty good, feeling pretty strong. But in fact, you're going to bonk pretty quickly. And we got up there, it was late in the day, and um, it was like, well, we can get to the top of this if we just push and we're willing to spend the night out. And fortunately, I was climbing with a woman who has far more, which had far more sense than I did. It's, and it's like, well, at what cost do you want to get to the summit of Mount Everest? Do you want to go back down and lose all your toes? You want to go back? Because we we're going to spend the night out without sleeping bags or anything. And it was like, no, nah, we're down. So um, that, um, and then, then we're down, and there's another storm, and this is uh, one of the more terrifying times of my life on the mountains because um, it's windy, and your tent's rattling, and it's snowing, and you're in a warm sleeping bag, and you, you drift off to sleep, and then you wake up, and you don't hear the tent rattling anymore, and you realize that the tent's been buried. And so, okay, it's probably no big deal. Probably the very top of the tent is exposed. And you look up and you can see that, no, you're completely buried. So um, we unzip the tent and we start cutting snow blocks and then taking the snow blocks and putting it inside the tent. And we're slowly filling our tent with snow blocks, hoping that we will dig our way out before we run out of uh, volume inside our tent, which we did. but. Um, a real claustrophobic uh, nightmare. And, and another trip to Antarctica, this was for National Geographic, um, a, a peak in Queen Maudlin, um, with a fairly illustrious group, Conrad Anker, maybe you've seen the, his, the film, Meru, myself, Alex Lowe, who's killed subsequent to this in an avalanche on, uh, in the Himalayas, Rick Ridgway, and then on the, on the, on the far, um, Right is John Krakauer, the author that maybe you're all familiar with, doing what guys do when they're away from their wives is uh, smoke cigarettes and, um, and go climbing. This sort of shows how climbing films work, is, um, is if you're only filming, it's, I mean, you can't lead with a, with a, with a camera. It's just, um, you can't lead anything really difficult. So um, usually someone leads across the section, then the cameraman goes across, and then they pull the ropes, and then the next next guys go come while the cameraman's up above. So you get that um, idea that you're that the cameraman's miraculously somehow ascended a, a ahead of the climbing team um, without any ropes or anything. Um, it, okay, there's an expiration date to um, this kind of a job because for only so long. Uh, are you, are you the guy, right? And, and the joke is that there's four stages to a, a, every cameraman's life. Uh, stage one is who is Michael Graber? Stage two is bring me Michael Graber. Stage three is bring me a young Michael Graber. And stage four is who is Michael Graber? <laughs> so, so I'm probably more stage four cameraman than I am stage three, but I like to think I'm, I'm, sort, of, um, I'm sort of in there. But I'm okay with that because I've done so many incredible, I've had so many wonderful opportunities that um, I'm, I'm totally okay to film from a ledge or, or, or not be the cameraman hanging on the middle of the face. Um, and um, it just, to me, there's a few, there's a, you know, looking back on my, on my career that there's a, there's a few things that I think really made a difference. And one was, one was that commitment that I had to make when I was still here at, at, at CMC. And I wasn't cognizant that I was committing to a career. I thought I was just committing to a passion. But, but these passions, never underestimate them because they lead to careers. They, and especially uh, if, you, if you have dreams, these dreams, I tell you, can lead to careers. So, um, I, you know, I, 
I think that, um, you know, what you want to do when you leave Claremont, or, or even if you've left Claremont and you're in the working world, you want to always strive for that job that you go to work, and at the end of the day, you don't know if you were working or if you were playing, that the, that the job has that much meaning to you, that it's that much fun. And I think um, life is going to try to beat the imagination out of you. But like Lewis Carroll said, imagination is your best weapon against reality. So don't ever, don't ever let anyone tell you, don't ever let anyone discount what you dream to do or what you imagine you can do because I think that it's, it, I think that's where greatness comes from. I think that, that these dreams, this imagination, this is what's going to make really a huge difference in how we approach the environmental issues that we're going to face in the, in the years to come. So that's it, yeah. Can we I'm, um, how are we on time and, and what, uh, well, in, in, anyway, I think there's probably a big agenda to, for this afternoon. I'm, I'm glad to hang around and visit with friends like I'm looking forward to doing and answering any questions if you have any questions or if you have a burning question that you want to fire up. If we have time, I'm glad that, no? No time. No time. Okay. Thank you very much. It was really, really fun to be back. Thank you.